What is up guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another episode of the Bleeding BNG podcast. Before we get too deep into this episode, you already know what I'm going to say. If you're checking this out on YouTube, be sure to comment, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe because guess what? If you can smell it in the air, football season is here and you want to make sure that you're tuned in and you're tapped into the channel because we're going to be pushing out way more content than we've done any other football season. You know, this is our fourth season coming up where we'll be covering the Washington Commanders and I promise you that we're doing it bigger and better than ever. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button to because you know you're going to get the most raw, uncut, and unfiltered analysis on the Washington Commanders from Bleeding BNG. And without further ado, let's get into this episode. To give you a time step as I do for all of my episodes. Today is Monday, July the 22nd, 2024, and that's right. It is the eve of training camp. I'm so excited, guys. We are finally here. We have we are finally here. It's been a long six months since we last seen our team play, and tomorrow the veterans actually um, report to camp. Um, the rookies actually reported last week, and I wanted to get an episode out, but but your boy, I know I'm the sickest person on the planet. Y'all know this. I'm the sickest person on the planet. But actually, your boy was actually, this time I was actually recovering from COVID. I was actually recovering from COVID. Yes, COVID is out there and it's still real in 2024. So if you hear me wheezing, um, I did test negative, so that's why I'm back. Um, but if you hear me wheezing or anything like that, that that's where that's from. Um, your boy ain't out of shape. We was just in the gym yesterday. Um, but yeah, that's that's where that's from. Um, but let's get into this episode. So I'm gonna have a training camp preview for you today, and then I'm gonna give you guys our early pre-training camp 53 man roster projection. I'm gonna try to speed through these things um, to not keep you guys here too long, because uh, I know I know you guys need to get to sleep. It's like the night before Christmas. It's like it's like December 24th. Is it December 24th or July 22nd? It's the eve before training camp, and I know that we're super excited. So I. I I know that. I know that. So I'm going to get you on. We're going to listen to this video. We're going to hear some of the most raw, uncut, and unfiltered analysis on the Washington Commanders. I'm going to have you set on your way so that come, you know, Wednesday when we're hearing all the news from John Kime and Nikki Javala and... John and JP Finley, whoever you want to hear it from, you're going to be well acclimated with who they're talking about and what they're talking about because you got all of your news over here for, um, from over here at the Bleeding BNG channel. Um, so, um, without further ado, let's get into this episode. So, for our training camp preview, I'm not going to give you too much. I'm going to give you some of the things that I'm going to be looking for because your boy will be boots on the ground for three out of the five days that they have open to the public that fans can actually attend. So these are some of the things that I'm looking for. Now, I know I know you come to us for the insight, but please take this with a grain of salt. Because remember, it's, it is training camp. And while this is, is the lead up to the real thing, if we can remember last year, they were telling us that uh, Emmanuel Fools was going to be the defensive rookie of the year. And they were talking about and praising how the tempo of um, training camp was being held under, you know, the watch of Eric B. Enemy. And we all saw that bullshit offense that ended up coming to fruition throughout the 2023 season. Everybody seemed like the offense was going to be projected to take off because of you know what we were doing because we were running the drills in training camp um I, i'll never forget that trend from last year um so while you do come to me um for a lot of transparency and a lot of insight please take what i say with a grain of salt but these are some of the things that um we're going to be looking for and hopefully you guys are going to be looking for going into um training camp tomorrow um i think the veterans actually report tomorrow and the practices actually start on wednesday but the first thing that we're going to be looking for um not to bury the lead um it's the biggest thing that everybody should be looking for is the development of Jaden Daniels and how his development is tracking throughout um the training camp over the next month this is this is easily going to be the most hyped training camp since um RG3 in 2012 and maybe RG3 in 2013 because the hype was still real then um that's why it's kind of a bummer for us to only have five open training camps but I completely understand it especially when you have the advantage of being the unknown in the NFL um with all these new culture staffs and this new personnel and things of that nature uh, because if you guys have ever been to a training camp recently you know they, they they're pestering people to put their phones away not show any plays but you know 
we're going to give you the exclusive access over here in Bleeding BNG because they done tried to stop us before, but they, they seem to never be able to. So, um, yeah, that is what we're going to be doing. Um, and going back to Jaden Daniels, um, I just want to see um, how he develops through camp. How many consistent uh, good days does he have? If he does have a bad day, how does he bounce back um, from that uh, the next day? Um, I'm going to be going in consecutive days um, two times, the first day of practice and the second day, and then I'll be going to the season ticket holders ultra event as well so just seeing how he tracks seeing how his um, development goes the next thing that i'm eager to see is what is this defense defense is going to look like and this defensive scheme in particular to be more specific because if you can remember in joe witt's introductory press conference he said i'm not about to give you the dallas defense we're not necessarily about to be a three four or a four three we're about to be a commander's defense and it gave me the sense that we're going to be having a lot of multiple defensive fronts and things of that nature and if you see a lot of the personnel that we bought in, we bought in a lot of versatile pieces that can play all across the board, like Frankie Luvu uh, cosplaying as an off-ball linebacker and an edge rusher. Uh, Jeremy uh, Chen cosplaying as a safety and a dime linebacker and things of that nature. I'm excited to see what we're going to do with that because, you know, me, when my, when my I took the binoculars out, when my man um, Brandon Ayuka actually posted some of our film from our practice, and if you followed me on Twitter, you saw I started to break down some of the schematic fronts that the defense was in and everything like that because I was just simply yearning for for, for football at that point. I was like Tyrone Biggum's looking for football at that point. Um, but yeah, it looked like in that um, particular still photo, it looked like we were running a 4-4 uh, defense, which you don't necessarily see a lot in the NFL and things of that nature. So I'm super, super excited to see what the defensive schemes and defensive packages um, are going to be rolled out through training camp and how the per personnel is going to be utilized in those packages. The third thing that I'm going to be super excited and I'm going to be looking for as well is Austin Eckler, how's his speed, how's his acceleration, how's his agility? Because if you guys are, you know, followers of the page and have been checking out Bleeding BNG for a while, you guys know that I think that Austin Eckler has the capability of hitting it big and being a huge um, time, big time contributor for this team. Um, and if he's unlocked and can give me. Not even I'm not even talking about Austin Eckler from 2019. If you can give me the Austin Eckler from 2022, this offense is going to reach heights that it hasn't seen since the since the years of Drake, Jay Gruden. It, it, it just is just just that simple. When you have a, a a first down chain moving type back like we've had in the past with a guy like JD McKissick, like we've had in the past with a guy like Chris Thompson. Well, guess what? If Austin Eckler can regain that 2022 form he souped up jd mckissick and he souped up chris thompson and you know that pains me to say as a president of the jd mckissick fan club but having those chain movers um like um what Jordan Reed was to our offense, um, like what DJ, uh, J.D. McKissick and Chris Thompson was to our offense. Those uh, those unlock the offense so that when you do when you do hit those big plays, you're those are just th those are deadly. Like right? those are deadly because you're you're picking at them, you're picking at them, you're picking at them, right? And you're doing everything so efficiently, moving the chains and things like that. They're so worried about that. Then that's when you hit them over the top with a 75 yard bomb to a uh, slot fade bomb to Terry McLaurin from Jaden Daniels. That's when you hit them over the top with a 40-yard post to Jahan Dotson. So I'm excited to see what a chain mover like Austin Eckler can do um, and to see if he has that speed and that agility back um, because he's been doing a lot of interviews and, and and things of that nature throughout the offseason, making his media rounds where he's like, yeah, I got it back. I got the juice back. And um, he's literally played hurt all last season. Uh, he... Got one high ankle sprain in week one, returned from that in like week six or seven, and they got another high ankle sprain in the other ankle. So he played with two bad ankles all season. So um, looking to see how um, he's recovering and how he bounces back um, in training camp this year. And the fourth thing that I'm really looking for is which one of his receivers is going to take the bill and build that rapport and build that chemistry with Jaden Daniels first. Um, my money is on Terry McLaurin just simply because of the type of guy he is. Um, you know, four straight 1,000 yard season. Um, just a pillar of success. Um, probably the most successful Washington commander that we've had on this roster since 2019. And my money would just be on him building that rapport uh, because he's done it with every quarterback. The 17,000 million quarterbacks that he's played uh, with in his short career. But 
hearing a guy, hearing the likes of a guy like Luke McCaffrey coming in the building with Jaden Daniels at 5:45 in the morning every day, um, being his draft classmate, um, you know his dad Ed McCaffrey is going to tell him everything to do to be um, your quarterback's best friend and be in his hip pocket and things of that nature. So I wouldn't be surprised if Luke McCaffrey was the guy to build that rapport. Um, is it Jahan Dotson coming off of a, a bad year looking to break out? Which one of these receivers is going to step up and build that um, rapport with Jaden Daniels first? And the last thing that I'm looking for, um, the most important thing that I'm looking for going into tomorrow is how are we using Jaden Jamin Davis? What exactly are we doing with Jamin Davis? Um, is he going to be an edge rusher full time? Is he going to be getting some off the ball snaps? Um, is he going to be you guys' version, Dan Quinn's version of, you know, what he had in Michael Parsons and Dallas? Are we going to be grooming, um, no Diddy? Are we going to be um, grooming uh, Jamin Davis to be that type of player in this defense? So those are the five most important things that I'm looking for going into training camp. Um, so hopefully you're more acclimated with knowing um, what you're looking for and what they're reporting on going into camp. And without further ado, before we get on out of here, I'm going to give you my way too early 53-man roster prediction. So as you guys know, as of right now, the roster stand at 90 players on the roster. Um, it used to be a cut down to 75 and then to 53 after the final preseason game. In between the final preseason game and week one, they eliminated that second cut. So they go straight from the 90-man roster that we have right now to the 53-man roster. That will be um, the 53 men um, that will be playing or that will be on the roster come week one of the official NFL regular season. Um, so to get uh, to get you ready for training camp, I'm going to give you the plays that I think are going to be on that final 53 going into week one. Um, and without further ado, and some reason is why um, as well. And it might be some surprise cuts. It might be some guys that you didn't think about. It might be some guys that you just simply didn't know. Um, and that's what we're here for. Um, so without further ado, let's get into this list. Um, so going on, um, I'm going to break it down into my offense. And then I'm going to break it down to the defense. And then there's a spot left off with three specialists. So there's really 50 open spots because three uh, the specialists get three of those spots in the long snapper, in the kicker, and the punter. And, you know, our punter solidif uh, is the most solidified lockdown position on the team in the GOAT uh, Tress way. I'm curious to see what number he's rocking on Wednesday. Um, our kicker as of right now is Andrew, Andrew Smits out of Syracuse. Um, and who knows who the hell the long snapper is right now. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that to, uh, to, to disintegrate or not or put put a, a dim light on the long snapper position because every every position is super important because we saw what a bad long snapper could, could, could do to a season last year. <clears throat> Cam Cheeseman, I'm looking at you on whatever couch that you're on. On whatever couch that you're on, I'm looking at you, Cam Cheeseman. So that just leaves us with 50 open spots. Um, so the way that my uh, roster got broken down is that we ended up with 26 offensive players and 24 defensive players that culminate into that 50, including three specialists. So let's get into this list. So um, I have three quarterbacks making the roster. Of course, our number two overall pick, first round draft pick, future uh, freights of the franchise in Jaden Daniels. Um, I have Marcus Mariota being his backup. And then I also have Sam, Hart and Sam Hartman, undrafted free agent out of the University of Notre Dame, making the roster. Um, one of the reasons that I kept three quarterbacks on the roster is that, you know, it seems that Sam Hartman and Jaden Daniels have built a, a rapport. They have a nice relationship. Um, I know both of them have mentioned how they were actually working out in the pre-draft before both of them decided to come to Washington. So that's always good to have. And I think that Sam Hartman has some talent. Um, I, he I know he went undrafted, but I think he has a lot of the intangibles that you want in the quarterback position. Um, he doesn't necessarily have the strongest arm, but he is a leader. If you saw what he did in his time at Wake Forest and the University of Notre Dame, and with Jaden Daniels' reckless play style, and if you saw a quarterback last year, who knows, Marcus Mariota can up and leave the team at any point, right? He can up and leave. Like, that's, that's what he did with the Atlanta Falcons, right? So I think that your safest and your best bet is to leave three quarterbacks on this roster, with the third being Sam Hartman. So that was my reasoning behind that. Uh, I don't think I need too much more explanation um, with that one as well. Um, so going on to the running backs. 
I have four running backs making their roster. I have Brian Robinson. I have the aforementioned Austin Eckler. I have our six-round draft pick um, from last year, Chris Rodriguez Jr. making the roster. And then I also have undrafted free agent Michael Wiley from the University of Arizona making this roster as well. And when I look back and I looked at um, Cliff Kingsbury's um, teams with the Arizona Cardinals. And then I also look back at Anthony Lynn's teams with the San Diego and the Los Angeles Chargers, whatever they were at the time. But um, a constant theme and a constant trend with both of those rosters is that when they broke camp and when they made that first initial 53-man roster, a lot of those teams have four running backs on it. Um, so I just stuck with that trend. Uh, we know that Austin Eckler is a lock. We know that Brian Robinson is a lock coming off of what many think um, was his breakout year. I think that he even has more to come to show this year in 2024. But I kind of liked uh, what I saw from Chris Rodriguez Jr. last year. He led the team in yards per carry last year. Now, I know he didn't get a lot of touches, and I know he uh, fumbled in a few of the touches that he had, but I thought he ran with some real juice, some real pop. He looked faster than what I remembered him being at the University of Kentucky, and I think that he can, he can give you that James Conner type back um, that, you know, Cliff Kingsbury had in um, Arizona. I think that they have similar running styles. Um, a lot of people have been comping um, Brian Robinson to James Conner and saying that that's Cliff's version of James Conner. I don't really see that. Um, they don't really have similar play styles. I think that Chris Rodriguez is Jr.'s um, play style is a lot more similar to a guy like James Conner than um, Brian Robinson. But... Um, the fourth running back that I had actually making the roster was Michael Wiley. Um, and the reason that I did this one is that we know that Cliff Kingsbury, he's like a robot, right? Um, and he loves his analytics. Um, and Adam Peters, um, also loves his analytics as well. And both these guys seem to love like scheme fits and, um, you know, players that match up with the, like the film match the analytics, um, and things like that. I'm not saying that they're just strictly nerds and anything like that, but they, they're guys that, that Analytics play a heavy part of their evaluation and things of that nature. Well, if you look at Mark, uh, Michael Wiley in the 2022 season, he was the most effective running back coming out of or, or um, the most effective running back in RPO situations in the entire country. Whether that be draft eligible running backs, running backs that came out in the 2023 draft, 2024 draft, non undrafted running backs. He was the most effective running back in RPO situations in the entire country in 2022. And let me tell you what we're going to be doing a lot of next year. Running a lot of RPOs. So I think that this is a perfect fit. Um, there was no surprise to me when they actually brought him in. Um, from the University of Arizona, and I think that he actually has a real chance of making this roster. He can be your, he can be the 2024 version of my guy Jared Patterson, or 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 Marcus Morris, uh, not not Marcus, Marcus Mason, Marcus Mason. He can be the 2024 version of Jared Patterson or Marcus Mason. So moving on, um, we have six wide receivers making the roster. Um, you know the Almighty Terry McLaurin. Jahan Dotson, Luke McCaffrey that I previously mentioned. We do have De'Ami Brown. Now, I know a lot of people have said that De'Ami Brown might be on the chopping block and things of that nature. And, you know, we, we're, we're famous for coining the tone or coining, coining the term De'Ami Brown just be out there running around. If you hear that, just know that came from us over here at Bleeding BNG. But I will say that with them not doing too much in the in the roster uh, in the receiver market throughout um, the offseason, I know that they re-signed Jamison Crowder and things like that. That told me that these guys might have more belief in De'Ami Brown than we actually do. I know that they brought in Luke McCaffrey, but it's not like the cupboard was full over here. You could have did more. You could have brought in some veterans. Um, but you need at least six or seven um, receivers on the roster. So for them not to do more, that kind of tells me that they might have more belief um, in the Army than we do as fans. And I'm not necessarily mad at it because I told y'all, I was there. You see the shirt. I was there in Richmond in 2021, right before um, the Army's rookie year, where he looked like goddamn Antonio Brown. I, I lied to you not. We have not seen it in the three years. He might just be a player that when the lights get when the lights turn on, they might get too bright for him. He might just be that type of player. But I was I, I remember that guy over there making Kendall Fuller do pirouettes at the line of scrimmage. I remember him over there baking Benjamin St. Juice, making him look like he didn't even belong in the same draft class as him. Now during the regular season, he's 
Raw Garner minus 2.0. He not even no, not not 2.0. He's Raw Garner negative 2.0. He's Darnarian McCants negative 2.0. He's Devin Thomas negative 2.0. But I was there, so I know that he has it. Um, he he didn't do the YouTubes this year, so he might be locked in. Um, so yeah, I think that he has a chance to make this roster. Um, the fifth um, receiver that I have making the roster is Alameda Zacchaeus, coming from the Philadelphia Eagles. And the sixth um, receiver that I actually have making this roster is Marcus Rosemey Jack Saint. Now, no, I didn't fall victim to the falling in love with that one-handed catch that he made in minicamp. Yeah, beautiful. Guess that's amazing. Yeah, keep making more of them. But he brings some size, he brings some physicality, and he brings some blocking that we don't have in that receiver room right now. At about 6'2", almost 6'3", um, he's a physical receiver. And coming from a Georgia pedigree, um, you know he's a winner. You know he's a winner. And I'm, I, I just played with the catch a little bit, but making those splash plays and things like that always help your case. So when I have those six receivers making that roster, that means that I do have Jamison Crowder getting cut. Sorry, Jamison. It was it was it was nice knowing you last year. You were arguably our best free agent in 2023. But I think that, you know, you might be a little over the hill. The top um, may have passed you up. And then I also have Mitchell Tinsley getting cut. But hopefully we can put him back on the practice squad if nobody else sweeps him up. Moving on to my tight ends. I only kept three tight ends. Cliff Kingsbury, um, before he got to Arizona, and bef not even before he got to Arizona, before he really got Zach Ertz, he didn't necessarily necessarily use the tight end position a lot. Um, and I know that we um, used um, some assets there with um, Ben Sinat being drafted in the second round, some draft capital there, um, some premium draft capital there with Ben Sinat uh, drafted in the second round. Um, so I do think that we're going to be having uh, the tight end involved in this offense a little bit. But I don't think that there was a need to have four tight ends on the roster, especially in, you know, Cliff Kingsbury's um, system. So the three um, tight ends that I have making the roster are Zach Ertz because he's familiar with Cliff Kingsbury. Ben, Sinat, ben Sinnott, I think he's going to overtake Zach Ertz by the end of the season and be tight end one. And um, like I said, we spent premium draft capital on him. And John Bates because he's simply still the best blocking tight end on the roster. Um, and, I, and I think I told you guys in my last episode, I think that we're really going to be running the ball a lot. Almost at like a 45-55 split. So that throwing the ball 57 straight times in a game, we're never going to see that shit again. For Eric, Eric Bianami should pay for all of his fucking sins. I, I, I mean that. I mean that. Even saying throwing the ball 57 straight times, that's, that's fucking asinine. That's blasphemous. But going back to the list, um, I think that we're going to be running the ball a lot. So I think that John Bates is still... Um, going to be needed on this roster. So with that being said, only keeping three tight ends, that means that both Cole Turner and Amarni Rogers get cut. And it's sad to see uh, because I've also seen, like I just mentioned with De'Ami Brown, I've also seen Cole Turner have some huge training camp practices as well where he looked like prime Jimmy Grant. But we haven't seen it in, in the regular season. We haven't seen it in his two years in the regular season. Um, now the guys that had brought him in, the previous front office regime that had brought him in, isn't there anymore. You can say the same thing for De'Ami Brown. But guess what? This new uh, uh, front office that we did bring in spent even more premium draft, um, you know, uh, draft assets on um, the tight end position than they did the wide receiver position. Ben Sennett was drafted before Luke McCaffrey. Ben Sennett was drafted before Luke McCaffrey. So whatever way you want to slice it, I think that Ben Sennett might be um, featured in this offense more prevalent than Luke McCaffrey initially. And that's not a good sign for Armani Rodgers or Cole Turner. Um, and to round out the offense, I have us keeping 10 offensive linemen. Brandon Coleman, Nick Allegretti, Tyler Biotis, Sam Cosme, Andrew Wiley, Cornelius Lucas, Trent Scott, Michael Dieter, Ricky Stromberg, and Mason Brooks. I'm um, not going to touch it to, um, or touch on the offensive line too much. Um, there's still huge questions at the tackle position. I think that our interior offensive line is pretty solidified. And I think that the one surprise name that I have that I really haven't seen a lot of people projecting to make the roster is Mason Brooks. Um, but I like what I saw from Mason Brooks last year. And if we're being 100% honest, you know, I was there boots on the ground more than enough last year. Mason Brooks was better than Chris Paul last year. 
And you can make an argument that he was better than Sadiq Charles last year. But, you know, the GM, Paddleboat Ron himself, didn't want to admit his fucking fuck up and, and say that the guy that he was that he drafted in Chris Paul wasn't better than this undrafted free agent. So Chris Paul ultimately ended up making the team um, over a guy like Mason Brooks. But Mason Brooks is a baller. This is a guy that was a five-star prospect coming out of high school um, and was a baller uh, playing in the uh, SEC at Ole Miss and things of that nature. And, I, and he's a better football player than Chris Paul. I don't care about projections anymore. I'm trying to win. I don't care about potential anymore. I'm trying to win. And coming tomorrow, July 23rd, 2024, Mason Brooks is going to be better than Chris Paul. So that's why he made the roster over a guy like Chris Paul. Um, it was, it was, we barely knew you, Chris. We barely knew you, seventh. We barely knew you. So moving on to the defense, um, I have 24 defensive players making the team um, to go along with the 26 offensive players and the three specialists. So my breakdown is the defensive line position. Okay, listen up, listen up, because I had to get a little creative over here on the, on the D-line position. I have Jonathan Allen, I have Deron Payne, I have Fedarian Mathis, John Ridgeway um, at the tackle positions, at the defensive end positions. I have Doris Armstrong, I have Cleveland Farrell, I have um, Dante Fowler, I have KJ Henry, and Andre Jones Jr. making the team. So that leaves um, Gene Baptiste um, from Notre Dame, our seventh round pick, to be cut. Hopefully we can put him on the practice squad. But if you guys are paying close attention, you notice that I didn't put Johnny Jerzon Newton on um, the the nine names that I just listed, and I know you guys are probably like, "What? What? This is our second second highest pick. What are you talking about, dude? You're crazy." No, no, no. The only reason that Jerzon Newton didn't make the initial fifty man roster, fifty three man roster, is because I don't think that he's going to be healthy by the end of training camp. You guys heard last week that he was um, put on the NFL um, I list um, where he's inactive. Um, it's a little bit different from PUP where he's going. He's not going to be eligible to uh, participate in the beginning of the training camp, but he can be taken off at any time. Um, but I'm just a little concerned with big guys and foot injuries, right? Um, this is his second Jones fracture on the over their foot so he's, he's had Jones fractures on both feet and now he's putting 320 pounds on that it's supposed to be pushing off and getting off of the ball and things of that nature sorry if I'm not too optimistic um, that he's going to be healthy come the end of camp and that's the reason why he didn't make this um, initial 53 man roster because I promised you I found I tried to look for every way to get for Darian Mathis off of this football team I promised you I promise you, I tried to look for every way to get Fedarian Mathis off of this football team. But with Johnny, with my man Johnny Jerzero Newton nursing an injury, I had to just put him here for the time being. But I promise you, as soon as Johnny Newton is healthy, Fedarian Mathis, you can pack your bags to the fastest bus back to Birmingham, Alabama. You can take that midnight train to Georgia on some Gladys night. Because I promise you it paint me to put your name on this list. To put your name on this roster. I promise you it did. Because we barely we barely knew that. So so cutting you, it ain't like we missing anything. You played about, what, two games in two years. So going on to the linebacker position, I have us keeping four linebackers. And those four linebackers being Bobby Wagner, Locke. Um, he's bought in to be the teacher's pet, the coach's pet. He's, he's Dan... Um, Dan Quinn's brain trust on the field. Frankie Louvo, um, our biggest free agent, our most impactful free agent signing. Like I said, he's going to be doing a lot of rushing off the edge. He's going to be playing a lot of off-ball linebacker as well. Uh, Jordan McGee, uh, fifth-round draft pick. Um, all of the reports coming out of camp was looking like he he looks like he belongs. Uh, and I think that he's actually going to be the guy to, you know, take over the throne from Bobby Wagner after this season and be the middle linebacker of the future for this um, football team. Jamin Davis, um, oh, I have five linebackers making the roster. Excuse me. I have five linebackers making the roster. Jamin Davis is the fourth one, and Anthony Pittman is the fifth one. Um, Anthony Pittman was a linebacker bought off for, from Detroit. Special team ace, um, and I know the likes of, like, Ben Standing and things of that nature were, um, you know, contemplated if Jamin Davis was going to be uh, a training camp surprise cut and things of like that. I don't have that on my radar just yet. 
And, and you know that we've been calling out training camp cuts for a while, making people look stupid when they say that we've been looking dumb for calling them training. I'll, I'll never forget when we said that Dr Jimmy Moreland was going to get cut and people told me I was dumb because we had the next prime time on our roster. Then we're nowhere to be found when he didn't make the final 53. I'll never forget those days. Um, but I don't see that being the case with Jamin Davis um, because I know people have mentioned how he hasn't necessarily played special teams. Jamin, Jamin Davis is athletic enough to play special teams. He's athletic enough to go run down and cover some kicks and some punts. <clears throat> so if we're just simply doing that, hey, I, 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 I'm going to get every penny out of my rookie before I, I just send him over to the scrap heap. We've already declined his um, you know, fifth-year option, so he's essentially in a contract year. So why not get everything that you can out of him while he's still on your roster? Um, sending him over to the uh, to the to the to the Salvation Army is isn't, isn't helping anybody. It isn't helping anybody. Um so and, and you still need depth at that linebacker position. Um, so I got five linebackers making a um, team, nine defensive linemen. And to round out our final 53-man um, roster projection is the 10 DBs that we have making this roster. It's Benjamin St. Juice, Emmanuel Forbes. Hopefully he has a much better year because come 2025, if it's like if his 2024 was like his 2023, he's going to be your training camp. Cause he might even he might not even make it to training camp next year. But as of right now, Emmanuel Forbes, Michael Davis, free agent that we bought in from the Los Angeles Chargers, Mikey Sanders still third round draft pick, Prince Anusium, undrafted free agent, priority undrafted free agent that we gave a two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars signing bonus to as soon as the draft ended from Colorado State. Um, and then for the safeties, I actually have Jeremy Chen. Um, uh, Quan Martin, Percy Butler, Derek Forrest, and Dom Hampton all making the team. So I have uh, 10 DBs, I have five um, five linebackers, and I have nine D linemen accumulating into uh, 24 defensive players. Now touching into the DBs really quickly, um, Forbes is in for a, a bounce back year. Um, I, I like what I saw from Michael Davis. Uh, I think that he's a lock to make this roster. Um, he's coming off of a down year last year, but everybody on the Los Angeles Chargers defense is coming off of a down year last year. So I'm not going to hold too much uh, and put too much on his plate where in, in that uh, regard. Um, I think that Mikey Samra still is the starter day one at your nickel back position. And I like Prince Anusium. Uh, and if a guy like Forbes doesn't pan out, he has a similar, um, you know, athletic profile, um, and he's, he's he's thicker than Forbes, but he, he has similar um, arm length and height to Emmanuel Forbes, so that if a guy like Emmanuel Forbes doesn't pan out, you can, you can, and I'm not saying it's an even trade-off because it's a first-round draft pick with an undrafted free agent, but when your first-round draft pick's not playing with a first, like, uh, first-round draft pick, who gives a, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Now, if you notice... With the with the DBs, I do have y'all boys, y'all boy, yeah. I'm call, I'm looking at you, yes. I'm looking at you, cause I'm pretty sure that you're a Jeremy Reeves fan, like a lot of them out there in Washington Commanders fan land, and Washington Commanders social media are. Well, guess what? I am not one of them. Just like I did with Federian Mathis, I look for every reason to to not put Jeremy Reeves on this roster, and I found one. Because guess what? Anthony Pittman is our new special teams ace. Who says it has to be a DB? Who says it has to be a DB? And the five safeties that I have making this roster can contribute on downs one through three. I don't know if you can say that for your boy Jeremy Reeves. So the story was amazing. Beautiful, beautiful video with Ron. But guess what? You can go with Ron and get up out of here. You can go with Ron and get up out of here. And I already touched on the specialist. So that'll do it. For our, our our 53, our way too early pre-training camp 53-man roster prediction. Let me know how you feel about our roster predictions. Um, Did we have some guys making it that you guys had getting cut? Did we have some guys getting cut that you guys had potentially making a team? Chop it up with us in the comments. Let, you know, let us know how you feel about this roster. And let me know, can this roster compete? How good is this roster? Is this roster that I assembled today, is this a, a, a seven-win roster? Is this an eight-win roster? 
Let me know in the comments. Chop it up with me. That'll do it for this episode of Bleeding BNG. As always, if you're not following us on social medias, make sure that you're following our Instagram, following our X. Our Instagram is at Bleeding BNG. That's B L E E D I N G B N G. Our X is at Bleeding BNG. B L E E D I N B N G. So there's only one G in our X handle, spelled a tad bit different. If you're checking us out on audio only platforms like Apple Podcasts, like Spotify, Please leave a rating. Please leave a review. Because guess what? Football season is here. So you're going to be looking up your team a lot. So leaving a rating, leaving a positive review is how we finesse these algorithms so that Bleeding B&G is the number one content hub that comes up in your search bar when you're looking up your Washington Commanders. Um, and without further ado, as always, please, guys, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you tune into the channel because I got a lot more content coming out. Because as I said at the beginning of the episode... Football season is here. I can smell it in the air on my beanie single. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode, and I'll check in on you guys later. Peace.